Welcome, 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 welcome to our How to Become a Great CTO Meetup. And I would like to remind you that How to Become a Great CTO is a dynamic meetup series designed for seasoned technical professionals who have already reached a point in their careers where they aspire to climb, climb higher. Um, why are we doing that? The series aims to highlight Ukraine's deep and diverse tech pool of talent. We are facing really hard times right now. And it's super important for us to bring, to develop new products, to push Ukraine to the next stage in its economic uh, development and to launch excited products that world can use. And therefore Ukraine can be famous, not only by its, by the, by its spirit, because of its spirit, but also because of uh, great uh, tech professionals. Uh, our goal is also to create a robust community and a platform where CTOs, current CTOs, playing, uh, playing gamers and um, uh, people who would like to become a CTOs uh, can exchange their experience, collaborate, empower each other, share business cases, and jointly innovate. And the most important, launch new products. Our meetups offer a blend of offline and online uh, interactions. Today we host a real virtual event. Virtual events are uh, hosted every second Tuesday of every month. Uh, they are, uh, the working language of these events are English. We, uh, we invite a lot of uh, international speakers as well as Ukrainians ones. And however, on the other hand, the last uh, Tuesday of each month is dedicated to face-to-face -face interactions in unit city in kiev innovation park and i'm so missing um face-to-face in-person meetings i hope that you missing them as well so just grab the link uh register and come to see us each session of these meetups pivots around a core theme uh, or issues um providing speakers ability to share their experience their insights their deep knowledge in, uh, in the specific topic. Today, we focus on business transformation. And I'm going to confess, this is a topic I requested because I've seen our, ex our exciting speakers. We have four folks today, and I believe that they uh, faced a lot of business transformation uh, in their experience. So hopefully you will enjoy the session as well. Um, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jana Mikhailenko. I'm Director of Engineering at Turnitin. I'm going to be your host for today. And in a good tradition of a great hosting, I'm going to be a bridge. Uh, the, I'm going to be a bridge and fill the gap between our esteemed speakers and our valued audience. So I encourage you, our viewers, you uh, do not hesitate, jump into the conversation and post your questions to speakers in the YouTube chat. Once speakers uh, finish their talk, we will dedicate about five minutes to address your question. 
So take your chance. And I'm ready and excited to announce our inspirational speakers today. We have four guests with a really different background in the tech field. We have today a Jonathan Wright, CTO at Eggplan AI, Alexander Solvio, ex CTO at Casta.ua, Dmitry Lavrenenko, a friend of mine, VP of Engineering at Uclon, and Nikita Voloshin, the last but not least, co founder and CTO at UT. So you will meet uh, the rest of uh, speakers a little bit later, but we'll start um, our Meet up with a really, oh, a really awesome uh, professional, Jonathan Wright. Jonathan is a strategic thought leader and distinguished technology evangelist. He specializes in emerging technologies, innovation, automation, has more than 25 years of international commercial experience with global organization. Jonathan combines his extensive practical experience and leadership with insights into real-world adoption of cognitive e engineering. I believe we are going to talk about LLMs, ChatGPT, and generative AI today. Jonathan is the chief technologist and head of R&D Labs at Eggplant AI. Dig digital leaders use Eggplant to deliver intelligent AI-powered automation, optimize customer interaction, and optimize business outcomes. Eggplant is an international company serving over 650 corporate clients in over 30 countries. I'm super excited to um, announce uh, John today. Hey, John, nice to meet you. Thank you for being with us here today. I've seen your YouTube channel. It seems like <laughs> you are a TED uh, talk speaker. So what are you going to talk today? Yeah, so it's amazing to be here and, you know, it's a fantastic uh, sessions which we've got lined up today. So, yeah, I, I should share my screen and that, that was a wonderful introduction and, and start uh, sharing some of the insights and maybe we can uh, we can cover a little bit around the TED and, and the journey uh, and hopefully send uh, share some of that uh, insight with you as, you know, business professionals on how you can transform your organization. I know the other guys and guests on this uh, session are going to go into a lot more detail, but I've got the the really kind of uh, high level, very fluffy title of AI won't replace teams, but rather enhance other teams with its power. Um, so I wanted to kind of share a little bit about that. And you, you mentioned about uh, my YouTube channel and, and my talk. I did a talk on uh, about seven years ago on cognitive uh, learning, uh, evolution over revolution. So as we talk about business transformation, that's really that kind of landscape. How do we help organizations change, especially when it comes to digital transformation? And, you know, how do we leverage some of the modern technologies that you kind of mentioned in that that introduction? So I'm not going to go back over my kind of uh, experience. Uh, I'm kind of spending a lot of time more recently. Uh, I'm on my fifth or sixth book. I just finished a book on artificial intelligence behind me. Um, but also I do a lot with, with MIT, the European Commission, uh, the British Computer Society. I'm actually based out in Oxford, but I'm actually flying out to uh, back to Santa Clara uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and actually, these slides are the first time uh, they've been aired officially uh, as I'm, I'm speaking at Gartner next week uh, around uh, generative AI. So, so let me kind of talk about a little bit about why we're here and why we're going into this kind of landscape of, of generative AI and, and what it means for you as business leaders, I suppose. Uh, and, you know, as the intro kind of stated around transforming IT uh, capabilities within Ukraine and, and bringing new products, uh, new and exciting products into market. So there's a lot of trends, you know, I'm, I'm involved with quite a lot of these from kind of quantum computing with the, with Microsoft Azure, uh, Quantum or Q-Sharp. Um, we actually do 6G with, with Keysight. We're one of the first companies to, to actually do 6G uh, bandwidth at uh, kind of uh, data transfers. But actually, today we're talking about generative AI, and you know, partly we all know about the excitement around this this area. There's it's pretty much everybody's LinkedIn profile, 
uh, talking of LinkedIn, if you want to add your, uh, add me, I'm just linkedin.com slash in slash automation. So it's just one word automation. Uh, but when we talk about automation, the generative AI kind of movements, depending on who you speak to, you know, Mackenzie is saying potentially we could, uh, you know, reduce 50% of our work activities, which are kind of referred to as the digital grind. Uh, but actually, if you look at Goldman Sachs and some of their recent uh, stuff around generative AI, they're a bit more conservative. About 35% of our day-to-day tasks could be augmented with this kind of technology. So I'm going to show you some of that, maybe a little bit too deep. I kind of took the dev challenge to heart and uh, went a little bit out of my comfort zone. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit first about the kind of the more high-level strategic kind of components. Um we actually, Keysight is the original Hewlett Packard. So it's the, the Dave and, and Bill Packard from, um, uh, you know, the, the birth of Silicon Valley. So actually, I, wearing the same shirt. Uh, I was the last time I was out there, um, I went back to kind of, uh, I think this is just down the road from Stanford University. But, you know, part of that original kind of build and test concepts, you know, they were building and developing software and it went through this incremental process and so even though you know the birth of the silicon valley as we know it on on, on the left hand side in 1939 which was key site and 1950s actually uh just be, uh, a few miles away from where i live at the moment is bletchley park which is where alan turing uh wrote his original papers on artificial intelligence and of course the singularity so you know part of this is it's not new technology it's you know we're talking 1950s 1939 here but what does this mean to your business, right? How do you change the way that you build and test software and, and, and get something into production very quickly? So I'm going to kind of give you the insights based on conversations that I've been having. I, I literally did a web. I've done, this is my fourth webinar today on, on uh, generative AI. But actually, I, I recorded a session last week with uh, with Diego from Forrester, uh, and we talked about kind of this raise of the Turing bots, uh, you know, and Turing again, referring back to Alan Turing on the previous slide, but it was around how do we address the activities that should be replaced by a uh, a, a kind of AI. Uh, and we're all very familiar as, as technical professionals around, you know, what's the challenges that we've got in our industry, you know, of course, bringing products and services to market faster you know, but also leveraging AI where appropriately. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in, and hopefully get into some of those questions. I know I've only got about 15 minutes to go. Um, but what I'm actually spe- talking about at the moment, and it's kind of where my R&D team are kind of spending most of their time, is around building the foundations to bridge the gap between all of these different platforms to understand uh, and provide intelligence or what what they refer the analyst community refer to as automation fabric. So this ability to exchange data, whether or not we're talking about operation, site reliability engineering or performance engineering or development, secure coding, whatever else it may be. So, you know, building these a bit like APMs, assurance platforms to really be able to understand, are we ready to go to 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 build and deploy into the real world? And that kind of, you know, challenger statement at the start of, you know, how do we bring that quickly without the risk of it it, it not working? Um, and so, you know, in, in essence, I wanted, I created two slides today, which I thought if you only have to have two slides to take away from today, these are the kind of the two slides. And I kind of first just threw on the, the, the viewpoint of how do we add these kind of Turing bots within our landscape uh, and you know and when we talk about Turing bots obviously I'm referring to large language models for the time being but it could be uh, a number of different components there but some of the technologies which you could potentially utilize you know if you're in the development community obviously things like Mojo uh, you know is kind of helping and Codem which is what uh, OpenAI actually used to test their platform uh, Auto GPT, which I'm going to go through in a little bit in detail today but, you know, there's pretty much where we said there's, you know, a Git repository for something, there's going to be a generative AI to solve that problem. And I'm going to kind of show you just a very high level of where we've got tools at the moment to solve all of these problems. 
The second slide, which I kind of said, which is kind of a very high level, I say high level, it's uh, probably melts most people's brains. But, you know, part of what I was working on for Gartner last week was this for, for next week is the human in the loop. Because I think humans, it, it, this isn't going to be an autonomous capability. This Everything has to be human in the loop or, um, you know, developer in the loop. You can't just expect this technology to go. You can't just get Copilot to go off and write all the code for the platform. You really need to be human centric. And so therefore, partly... You've got to redefine how we actually use these tools. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, about how we have kind of moved away from using large language models uh, to, to building our own um, and training them on our own sources of knowledge. Uh, and what does that look like? Um, and really, when I talk about sources of knowledge, I'm talking about all the knowledge you have within your organization. It could be documentation. It could be process. It could be technical docs. It could be your systems and how those systems work at the moment. It could be your industry, right? It could be retail GPT or fashion GPT. You know, we're going to start seeing this emergence of more narrow but focused on domain uh, based uh, solutions instead of more generic kind of general uh, large language models. So very high level. I'm going to try and deep dive some of this in a little bit of detail to at least give you that kind of viewpoint. But But kind of what I wanted you guys to take away today was you know, well, what's the difference? Uh, my friend Jason, who used to work at Google, um, you know, he talks, you know, this is a quote everyone's seen actually came from somebody else, but, you know, it's not AI that's going to replace you. It's a person that's using AI that will. And when I say this, I'm talking about your team. Um, and, you know, we've seen the power of chat GPT, I suppose, uh, in the sense of, it outperforms a um, a medical doctor with a number of years of experience. But I think with this comes this kind of challenge of, well, if humans, a human doctor's able, only makes, say, three, three misdiagnoses every hundred, which is probably not correct. Um, but, you know, that's fine because we're human and we're allowed to make errors. But if you tr use a, uh, an LL, uh, a large language model, then potentially you could be be, could be actually uh, accountable for that kind of it from a legal perspective. So this is why I've added in these additional kind of slides as a kind of a, a, a viewpoint to it. So we use the, the the Dolly stuff to build some of our own models and we started using Azure's uh, services as well for a lot of stuff, which you'll see in some of the demos that I pulled together. But there's a big question around, especially the EU AI Act, around <clears throat> what the legislation is going to look like. Now, this could be very similar to what we saw with GDPR in the sense of, you know, they're saying that it's 6% uh, fine, uh, and that's okay, if I suppose, if you're a startup and you can afford it. But actually, is this going to stifle uh, potential progress in this area? And we're, we're seeing the whole out of kind of should we be putting ai on hold um and a lot of it is kind of again noise you've got people like elon who actually sat on the board for open ai who create created chat, chat gpt wanted to be ceo like he always wants to and then they they chucked him out and then straight away he's just registered x.ai to, to kind of start competing against this capability so we know people are going to start leveraging it we know they're going to start building it into their products and we know there's going to be a lot of regulatory and compliance challenges this year. And that's why I think next year we'll start seeing products coming into the market, hopefully a lot from Ukraine around specialist large language models that are domain specific. So I also added at the start as well, you know, I, I partially mem mentioned Web 3.0 and this kind of viewpoint of, well, it's a lot more than just large language models that are going to differentiate this next generation capabilities. And as technology, you know, chief technologists, you've got to be looking at, well, what's the future? What are some of these other technologies that you potentially need to be investing in? I, I spent most of last year talking about the metaverse and, and out of the back of that, uh, with a lot of the kind of devices behind me, like the the, the HoloLens and, uh, and Oculus Pros, you know, part of it was what's the blurring of the boundaries? We're seeing, you know, it's not just a move to Web3, it's a blur of you know, leveraging things. We saw Twitter and, and Malmstrom and decentralized 
technologies coming through. We're seeing distributed computing, edge computing to start coming through. Um, and, you know, I think this is architectural decisions that you need to be thinking about for the future, which will leverage this kind of generative AI capability. Now, I've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to kind of just go through, and I'll see how far I can get some examples with, with GPT, and maybe as we go into some Q&A, uh, we'll, we'll maybe explore some of those in, in more detail or not. Um, but actually, I think one of the other colleagues today is going to actually talk to you about large language models and the kind of the, the race to, to, to kind of build those and the rise of those. So, you know, most of you will have heard of ChatGPT, uh, which is part of the OpenAI family. But really, when we talk about GPT, we're talking about generative pre-trained transformers. And we've seen various different ones. We've seen success, of maybe for some, like Microsoft, have built them into their products quite seamlessly. You've seen others like Google that's really hit the, it, was it too early? And, you know, has, has caused massive uh, controversial costs off their stock price. So we know about generative AIs and we could even look at it from the fun side of things if at GPT, which I occasionally, this came from one of my developers today, uh, which is a light hearted kind of thing. But back in December, uh, you can probably see in the corner here, you know, we built chat GPT into our platform and said, oh, well, it's great to have like a chat bot that you can ask it questions. You can get it to define Gherkin scripts uh, and and and, and spec uh, requirement specifications. But actually, this text to text functionality is fairly basic. Right. And if we look at the larger landscape and we take maybe to the right hand side, the, the opposite end of this. So when I was at Mobile World Con Congress um, in Barcelona, you know, this is one of my Israeli colleagues who's actually using brain to input. So all the neural lay stuff that you've talked about, you've seen with Elon, uh, you know, this is actually directly taking uh, brain waves to users input su support. So if you think about how we interact with computer systems at the moment, it's actually not that far away before we start seeing this kind of evolution of these tools to actually, you know, be uh, take a lot of that work away from us. Um, so anyway, I'm going to give you a very high level and maybe flick through some of these just as a, a kind of a show you what we've been doing with them. You know, we use a lot of DALI at the moment, uh, mainly for image generation. Uh, we started playing with Alpaca when we started looking at how we can kind of move away from uh, just using the challenges of just using chat GPT. Um, I actually got a couple of interesting demos today through Runway, if we get time. Uh, the Google AI stuff is uh, phenomenal. We use a lot of that. Uh, we use Resemble for voice uh, capabilities so we can speak to things like the HoloLens just by, you know, sending it commands. Um, you know, we're doing a lot with the Microsoft Cognitive Services. Again, all the Azure stuff is phenomenal. Uh, Git. Copilot, I've got in here a little bit, but again, you, you can you can leverage a lot of this technology really quickly. Mojo was on the the list of the ones that I would definitely recommend. Of course, you can go and have a look at the GitHub AI collections there if you want to see that in a bit more detail. But can, let me show a few demos to bring hopefully bring it a bit more to life. Um, so I kind of put my my kind of my development hat on as this is the dev challenge. And kind of uh, with my generated avatar was like, well, what kind of systems uh, and, and opportunities can we test? And the story which we have at the moment, which is it writes the Gherkin scripts, which are the requirements. It writes the code, which is in Copilot, writes the tests for us. It deploys it into the environments with Auto uh, GPT. So how can you leverage this to take these kind of technologies today? So most of us probably started with this chat GPT interface on the left hand side and used a human in the loop to actually write those requirements. And of course, that's fairly straightforward. It, you know, I took an example from my friend from Google and we said, OK, uh, you know, let's try and create some specs for the Microsoft uh, stock price. Uh, and I've done a number of different chat GPT kind of webinars and uh, podcasts, it's quite, if you want to Look at the qalead.com or a few other ones. There's there's loads out there what I've done. But what we in essence did is the next step is took that executable specification, created a model. And you're probably kind of guessing the next step from that model, we then uh, went from text to model, which is the Gherkin syntax. And then we created from that 
text to code. So we literally just passed it over to Copilot. Copilot then you wrapped around um, the uh, Panda data frames and generated a stock exchange. So now we've got an app to test on. Um, it feels like the fastest ever I've ever done this, but then we created some UI testing scripts and some API, you know, Postman scripts to test the system. Again, this is all coming from ChatGPT using Python. So we took that, regenerated it. We just hooked the API into our prop platform. And then now we're able to actually run and test against the application. So we're actually able to run it and test what the stock price is and check that the application's working as corrected. So this is kind of the direction we came to. And then after this, we started looking at more kind of advanced use cases such as, okay, now we've got it, we'll put in the telemetry. So we'll start adding in uh, captain and uh, adding in some, some information so we can look at it on Datadog or whatever else. So we added everything as part of the entire flow, but let me kind of skip forwards a little bit to that because I know we've only got one minute and 30 seconds by my clock. Um, but auto GPT really solves the short-term memory problem of you know individual threads of activity versus an overall task. So in the example before, if you want to be able to deploy into production, you can literally ask auto GPT and it will you know give it some of your public and private keys it will go off, it will try and do the whole continuous build, deployment, delivery, and actually try and release into production and then, you know, um, check that all, all the system's working and it's all hooked up correctly. So I think auto GPT is going to make a massive difference into the into this landscape. I've got apparently two minutes left, so uh, that might be just <laughs> the two minutes. Um, I'm going to just show you some quick examples while uh, the, our host joins us back. We did, uh, again, some, some capabilities within uh, computer vision to drive things like the HoloLens. So again, using computer vision, mainly the Microsoft and custom vision and uh, some of the Google stuff. So anyway, let's. I'll open some kind of questions and I'll skip these in the background while we're waiting for questions because I know there's a 30 second delay between the live stream on YouTube and those people who are watching YouTube today. And of course, the questions that are coming in. So hopefully I can get the host to come back. Uh, I'll keep on sharing some of these demos in the background. But, you know, if anyone's got any questions, maybe I can start taking them at the same time. That's my 20 minute timer. <laughs> awesome. Any questions? Awesome. Yeah, we have questions. Of course we do. First of all, thank you so much for an exciting topic. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, listening to your perspective and actually having some insights from you before Gartner. Uh, it's a game changer for me. Thank you for hearing that. No worries. So I really like your statement that you won't be replaced by AI, but you will be replaced by a person who uses an AI. Uh, I really believe in that. Uh, you're right, therefore, I encourage all engineers, for example, with Turnitin to use ChatGPT, LLM, to play with that widely, because I believe that we need to train some skills uh, and adopt technologies super quickly. So the first question that we have, actually, is how do you anticipate generative AI will redefine the role of a CTO or chief technology officer? Do you have any examples of how currently playing CDOs can use ChatGPT now in their day work? Um, it's interesting. So there, there was a, a great Goldman Sachs um, uh, article around a generative, well, an a, a narrow AI replacing a CEO and then actually making the decisions at the CEO level and the C-suite level for a year, and it outperformed the user, which was a uh, which uh, other CEOs in the class. Now, I don't think CTO specifically, like you probably wouldn't want it to recommend what tech stack or whether or not you should be using cyber robotics or something else. My next call actually is with our CIO, uh, Dan, who's, you know, and I'm not sure I want a generative AI to replace my C-suite as of yet, but... I think where the CTO really positions is the enablement of the technology that allows the teams to be able to consume more of this with the viewpoint of registration as well. So trying to understand 
what are the valid use cases? What can they do? What can't they do? What should they do? So like yesterday I was with a, a Netflix producer and I showed her this video um, around a generative AI that just created an entire film. Uh, and this is the runway stuff, which is on the screen at the moment. Now, all this is done by an AI. Does it put out filmmakers out of a job? No. Does it have uses like being able to kind of work, create content for B-roll uh, to, to help them with their editing times? Probably yes. And I think that's the kind of questions that the CTO needs to be asking is, yes, there's all this great capability, but which ones are applicable to their industry and their domain and address their challenges as they are at the moment? Okay. Thank you. And continue actually conversation. Uh, so everybody in technology needs to right now at least play with chat GPT and to understand what is that. But do you have any, can you suggest any strategies for CTOs? How to inspire their teams to embrace a lens and chat GPT in their daily work? How to make people actually use these tools? These tools are new. We have early adopters like five or 10%, but what about the uh, other folks? Yeah, so again, I, I, my my call, which I've got at the top of the hour with my, with our CEO, uh, CIO, and obviously Keysight's a, a four billion pound company. We got twenty thousand employees, two hundred different countries. It's obviously scaled, and I, they acquired Eggplant um, in two thousand and twenty, which is the company that I'm I'm part of. Um, and you know, part of those challenges are organizational levels and. Actually, my right recommendations to him uh, this afternoon is, well, in an hour is going to be, you know, let's look at innovation lab projects that we can disrupt ourselves because they're very much in this kind of different multimodal development phases where we are obviously doing things like scaled agile and, you know, taking on, you know, uh, new disciplines like chaos engineering and site reliability engineering and lean UX and all the kind of the, the buzzwords of how to bring software quickly to customers but then there's the waterfall v model very slow releases for things that they build in hardware and then you know software's moving at such a, sp a speed and they're kind of the idea is oh well we'll just go off and throw 20 people at the problem uh and then we'll have a, a an ai solution is i don't think that's the right thing is you've got to allow teams to innovate and and play with this technology discover use cases and then kind of allow them to pitch to themselves uh, in a bit of a shark tank stretch dragon's den format the the concept that may or may not disrupt the underlining kind of core business of what you're in i think if you go off with the viewpoint viewpoint of actually going and trying to create innovation for innovation's sake you probably find that you won't innovate so that's kind of what i've learned is that it's great to have an r d team uh, and you know i love my cambridge based r d team dearly but you at the same time you want the disruptor projects that have a bit of funding that can go off experiment learn this technology and see what they can uh, do with it love that thank you okay we also have some uh questions in the chat um uh, so how did you come up with this idea and how much trial and error did you have? I do believe it's related to the actually uh, videos that you showed. Yeah, so a lot of it was customer based was a lot of came out from from the metaverse last year is working with people like Microsoft and Meta um, and Google, you know, they're all building products for this new Web3 kind of landscape. Um, and we're trying to find ways of solving things that haven't really been solved. Um, and I, you know, when I was in Silicon Valley last time, I was we were talk. I was talking to a hardware company that's trying to solve motion to photon latency, which is kind of when you move and then it updates, whether it be a screen uh, or it would be a headset, which makes you feel sick when you use it. Um, you know, trying to innovate to try new technologies to be able to get higher speed computer vision or better accuracy in your computer vision. As you're trying to solve customer requirements, you can then, in a way, you realize that you're productionizing a capability that in essence you can offer. And I've seen this with lots of companies that I've I've been involved with before. Or, you know, you might be a, a pizza 
delivery company, but you write such a great uh, algorithm around uh, route optimization for your for your delivery people that actually you start offering that as a service or as an AI. And I think this is the thing is you've got to look and identify what is just your core product, what you know you need to enable your customers, and then what could you potentially com- uh, commoditize and 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 contribute to the wider community. And there's a lot out there. There's a lot of communities of practice which you can contribute to and get involved with. The European Commission's a great one, the AI Alliance. You know, there's no reason that any of the CTOs that are here today aren't part of the uh, AI Alliance for the European Commission and getting all that information about the latest research and use cases that you could potentially, you know, power your business with. Okay, so we talk a lot about uh, legislation, and I believe that this year is going to be challenging for uh, OpenAI and all LLMs. We'll see how it's going to develop because of legislation and these problems. I'm uh, curious to hear to hear your opinion about AI safety. Actually, when we use such tools as ChatGPT for generating code, for brainstorming our ideas, for using our prompts, so do we? transfer intellectual property? Do we transfer some really valuable idea to chat GPT and companies behind that so they can use it on their behalf and probably kill our business at some point? So it, it, it is a myth. Unfortunately, about 90% of what you hear, uh, you know, and the example which you're giving is the kind of the Samsung engineer who kind of asked uh, passed it its code to do some refactoring on it or some style improvements and then was suggested his, her, it, the, their own code uh, later on. I think that might be a myth in the sense of um, what chat GPT or OpenAI does is they do have a retention policy on all the questions that have been asked. They do say from an opt-in, opt-out perspective that actually that's only used for improvement of the product like we always hear but the same happened with Alexa and whoever else. Uh, you know, part of it is where is that training data going? Will it, your IP go into the public domain? I think the answer is no, but there is concerns around safety in this area. That's why I kind of mentioned before about things like Alpaca and other kind of large language models that you can deploy on your own private cloud uh, if you want to kind of mitigate that, and it's the same for, for computer vision or any other kind of uh, AI kind of technology. However, you know, the EU AI Act is very much in its infancy. Um, I, I do think it's going to block progress in certain aspects because it is taking a mentality uh, around maybe software and hardware and not really thinking about how evolutional software de- development is. Um, so, we, you know, I I wouldn't, I, I, I'm a big advocate for, safety as far as how people can use it uh safely within your organization uh you know i'm sure you know your engineers are smart enough to not have tracking information to in essence uh, redact any kind of sensitive information that they are concerned about but then you've seen kind of some of the examples with bing so bing did a really good job at bringing in chat gpt of course straight away the media had a go at them about well it's trying to get nuclear code And then a a legislation came out to say no AI will be used to make decisions about nuclear uh, launch. Well, that's a fairly straightforward thing. You would expect that it's a human in the loop. And I think this is why human in the loop is so important, is that actually if you take that away from it, then the reliability and the trustworthy of the the results is, is questionable. I think you've got to have somebody who understands the domain, understands their specialism, who's able to interpret the results, but also learn how to refine the question so that it actually gets some value out of it. So it's the normal garbage in, garbage out viewpoint, but also you've got to understand there is implications around taking it at face value. In essence, it's just been trained on Google. Would you trust what you Google and say, oh, I'm not feeling well, you know, and it tells you that you've got X, Y, and Z symptom. You know, I think we're going to see a lot more narrow AI before we see general AI that's going to really kind of open things up. So understand your use case, understand your domain, use responsibly, and again, you know, take precautions where necessary. Okay, now we know at least. Thank you for touching this emerging topic. 
I believe that we are right now in time for the next speaker, but I would like to uh, thank you for sharing your insights. And uh, just a reminder, Jonathan has his YouTube channel. Uh, you can find his LinkedIn uh, profile as well at uh, Dev Challenge uh, social media accounts. Follow him. Um, thank you again so much for being with us. See you pretty soon. And it's uh, a time for to introduce me and our next uh, exciting speaker. Uh, the next guest is Alexander Solovyov. Uh, he is an ex-CTO uh, at Casta.ua. Alexander is experienced software developer. He enjoys efficient and simple solutions, solving real-world problems and balancing code quality with time the results. He has led teams of more than half of this career and is proud of the fact that he often makes wise choices in technology and architecture. I love that the last statement, for sure. Alexander has been a technical director of the largest online fashion marketplace in Ukraine, Casta.ua, for the past eight years, and is now an independent consultant. He is active in various development communities, a well-known speaker, author of open source codes. I knew Alexander before. He's pretty famous in, um, actually, a uh, development community in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. I also heard that Alexander has a really great uh, profile in terms of being a uh, plain CPO and CPO in Casta.ua. I'm super curious to hear about this experience. Probably you will talk about this during uh, your speech, maybe next time. But anyway, I'm super excited to welcome you. Hi. Uh, Hi, welcome. thank you. How are you doing today? I'm fine. I'm a little bit fluttered and too much fluttered by introduction, you know. It's like feels I don't know. Come on. I'm not sure if I if if I wrote it, yeah, and um, I need to tone it down next time, I guess. <laughs> no, we didn't. Anyways, it's, it's um, my research. Yeah. Um okay. Anyway, I um, I'm not, you know, planning on um, talking uh, in concrete details of my days in Casta, but of course the talk is going to be based on my time there. Um, since that's the only place I've been situated. So uh, anyway, um, my topic is the embrace the change, which is, uh, just a second, I'll share the... Does it work? I hope so. Yeah, not, not uh, yeah. Um, which is the I'm going to talk about building a change resilient systems, um, which is a really mm, loud uh, name for mm, like being able to change a system many times in a row in a sequence, right? Uh, uh, and start changes during previous changes and uh, support business um, as it wants to change everything, right? And um, every business book or a course will tell you that the most important thing to optimize in business is the speed of change that business can sustain. It's just because the world around changes a lot. And if you're slower than your competitors, if you change slower than your competitors, competitors, then compound interest of that difference will just crush a business in a few years. And, um, uh, you know, it's surprising. But now um, I now think that while building a team, growing your system and nurturing good code is important, it's not the main goal of a good CTO. What is it, though? Well, listen on. So how do I know what is the main goal of the CTO? It's, um, I've spent eight years as a CTO and uh, I like to think that it was an okay, maybe even better than okay results. And um, Casta wasn't the largest uh, player in Ukrainian e-commerce and uh, so had to run faster than others to even survive. And we did run fast. And right now, Casta uh, has culture and abilities to make changes extremely swiftly, thanks to the efforts of the team. And if you want to build something to last, you can't predict what's going to change. 
It could be anything, right? Market can change. Your perception of that market can change. Your assumption of your um, about user behavior could be wrong. A war could happen, right? Anything can happen. And uh, um, we can still categorize uh, concerns about um, changes into technical and non-technical. So let's talk about technical stuff a little bit. I firmly believe in saying data is king. That's the foundation your system is standing on, practically the blood of the business. And if you're not paying attention to the ways you store and work with the, with the data, you're going to have a hard time adapting to change. Just a small example. Let's imagine we have this abomination as a part of our DB scheme. I don't think I have enough time to explain what is going on here, but it took me three weeks just to understand what is uh, what is really going on here. And you'll, you'll have to believe me what a simpler version would look like, but it's just that. I mean, it's a product, a variation of that product, right? SKU is our slang term for size of, of a product and uh, some item in a basket. Just just look at that, right? It's uh, how many? eight tables uh, joined in, the, in an intricate ways. I mean, you can laugh about that picture. It's like a, it has many layers where you can laugh at um, what's going on here. And uh, Alex. that, right. I'm, I'm going to brutally interrupt you. I'm really sorry. Yeah, but okay. I believe that you are showing us some slides which we cannot see right now. We are still on your first slide. Holy shit. Uh, just a little. Okay. Uh, how about now? Still the first slide? Yeah. So um, something went wrong. It just give me a little uh, bit. Sure, I'll try sure. to Take fix that time. stuff. Uh, Sorry for for the audience. We're going yeah, to fix no, no, it. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, shit happens. Okay, now it works. I'm. I feel really weird that I didn't notice that myself. I mean, it's staying on my screen actually, right? So it feels weird, but I got in 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 the flow, I guess. No, yeah, is yep. it better? I see it now. Yep, awesome. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, so that shit is an abomination, right? Okay. I mean, everything before that was just text, and now it's uh, more interesting, a little bit more interesting. And uh, uh, yeah, so I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, right? That is a product uh, variation and uh, an item in a basket, just that stuff. And um, I'll show you one once more. I mean, just try to soak that in, right? Understanding that stuff is really, really hard. And obviously, a schema like that can sustain much more damage, right? We transition from a flash sale to a general merchandise and then to a marketplace. I mean, uh, and it, uh, those transitions were have changed companies through and through, and our little schema held up uh, well against changes. Um, it's not always we ch the change we've designed, like the schema migration or uh, the data transfer was the most efficient we could have done in that um, time. But it, it takes time to understand your problem clearly and you don't always have the time, to be honest. So what, what are you going to do in that case? Well, what you are doing, you're not... We, what we did, we fixed our problems, right? Sometimes it took years to get layout into state into a satisfying state of uh, simplicity and synchronize it clearly with business needs. But that state was always good as a launchpad for, for the changes. So like nurture your data, care about it. Uh, another one is architecture. It's uh, pretty obvious in my uh, opinion, but anyway, if uh, when everything you have is just a single process, changes are much easier. And when you decide to build that microservices architecture, suddenly all your mistakes become coded into a distributed ne network. And that hard stuff is really resistant to change. And it's resistant, not resilient, right? There is uh, a John Gold's law, which is which 
everybody loves and you can read on wikipedia about it and it, it he formulated it like 40 years ago and um, everybody agrees that you can build a complex system from from scratch you have to build a complex system a complex system from a simpler system and um, simplifying i think that simplifying existing system before critical changes could be much easier than changing a complex system. So it's like a variation of goals law. Um, also tools, tools are really important. Programming community, especially various, um, I don't know, programming community, I think tends to discount uh, important importance of tools a little bit, like programming language doesn't matter, stuff like that, but it's incredibly wrong, I think. I mean, some lang languages are more productive than others. Fixing bugs in statically typed code bases is much easier than in dynamic languages, right? Because you are more sure about what's going on here. But building with a dynamic language is faster usually because you don't need to like think. Anyway, I mean, it's uh, up for debate, but then... Uh, Programming, some languages are more productive than others. Then ecosystems have different strong sides, right? You're not going to be building a machine learning application in Ruby. Anyway, like an example, when I was trying out Vespa, which is um, something akin to Elasticsearch, but better. I got, it took me an hour to get my speed. Um, it took me an hour to speed up my indexing to a thousand documents per second. Because I was in GBM, my brother, on the other hand, had to build uh, a Rust extension to get speed to um, a reasonable um, speed. Uh, because uh, getting over 100 documents per second in Python was too hard. So what would be easier to change if need arises? Obviously, having like two languages is going to be much harder to change. So your tools are extremely important in building um, a system which is resilient to change. Just um, rewatch uh, talk about uh, talk by Rich Hickey, Simple Made Easy. He's um, speaking a lot about that stuff. Anyway. Coming to the next one, I'm quite convinced that backward, backward compatibility is extremely important so on the one hand if people are dependent on the results of your work don't make them work more just because a new name for a database column is better than the previous name right on the other hand sometimes you just need to do that and when business um needs are changing a lot you have to learn co to coordinate how to mig to migrate to new APIs, to new to a new data layout, to a new data exchange patterns. This is a fine balance between creating additional work without the necessity and keeping your system simple, but you'll help to learn. I mean, it's a cultural thing. And um, I think the culture of breaking backward compatibility in a nice and controlled way is an important skill. And to sum it up, Data is your foundation, so take care. Having a simple architecture gives you options about where you want to go. Better tools give you options still, and culture is important as always, which leads us to people, right? There is a question. Why are you CTO? It's For me, it was about having more leverage, about deepening the impact I can have and about bringing these ideas to life faster than I could ever do that myself. And uh, that is all done by other people, right? It's not my hands that who, who, which are doing that. So that is kind of obvious, right? It's, you all know that. And, um, but caring, uh, even if obvious, is hard. And you have to think about it a little. Um, every day, I guess. Knowing people man means you can give the work they find more satisfying, which leads to um, uh, faster and more efficient uh, execution or having better words to support them if they are in, you know, emotionally in their own place or finding a better and more efficient way to grow them. Well, just make them feel appreciated 
and you won't have burnouts. Even if that means firing an underperformer, that is that one is still hard and might blow to me, but just firing the wrong person can make a team twice as fast and twice as agile or able. Agile has a bad connotations right now sometimes, right? Train with them to make changes. When I just started working at Casta, the team there did not track database migrations. Like I was surprised for, for a minute. But then it turned out that they just don't do database migrations. Like they don't track them because they don't do them or the other way around. I have no idea. And um, among other problems, password restore page wasn't working. So it was done by uh, technical support through a call center. So we started with fixes like that, right? Fix password restore page, and then implemented database migration tracking. And then we proceeded to fix database schema, uh, like the one you saw about basket. And then we fixed uh, various long-standing issues like oversetting. And then in just a year after I started, we changed business model. So on one hand, you just can't woke up one morning and do big changes with an inexperienced team. On the other, it's amazing how fast people are going to learn if you push them. And and you should push them. Uh, Most people are afraid of change. Some people hate being out of comfort zone. There are various reasons, but most people learn faster and feel more accomplished, uh, accomplished if you push them. So do that. And um, going back to the main question. The main goal of the CTO, which is a firm belief, is building a resilient system. And the resilient system consists of team that can build fast with a quick resolve and a code base, which is complex enough to support business, but simple enough to absorb changes. I think that is all I have to say on the topic. And I'm ready to like take some questions. Nice. I really enjoyed it, actually. You uh, talked about several pillars of leading in business transformation and being a great leader, great technology leader, and great people leader. Uh, thank you for that. So I have a couple questions for you. And um, so since we're talking this month about business transformation, uh, I'm curious uh, to know how often from your perspective, how often you should revisit your architecture and what are main key triggers that enable you as a CTO, as a technical leader, to consider changing the architecture of application of the system? I think that is um, a really complex question, which is um, really hard to answer like, uh, you know, in deterministic way. So I myself um, live in, uh, let's say, a pain-driven development, right? If you feel pain about changing some stuff too much, then it feels like your architecture is not up to the standards you have to have, right? I think that that is not the best way to convey the meaning because the pain threshold of different people is really different and uh, uh, it's hard to overstate how different it is right so i can't like just come up to somebody and say if if it feels painful then it is uh, yeah, there is a need to change for um, it is it is hard. I don't have any like you know hard data saying like if uh, that task takes too much time, then you're up to change. Unfortunately, our field is um, a little bit more complex than the real world architecture of building houses. I believe uh, that the programs are so much more complex than that we as uh, human beings are not in a real position to 
I think that everything can be um, reasoned in, you know, in, um, how would you say that? I Do you see the point I'm trying to make? Like some stuff right. is uh, is based on feelings and feelings are different from uh, from uh, person to person. And so it's really hard to convey. But for me, it's just uh, about pain, right? If it's fa- it feels painful twice, <laughs> then there is a need to change something. Of course, um, that depends on the size of a change, right? Sometimes I did that a lot of times, right? When I went to business and asked them not to do something because it's going to be painful. But there is, I had um, lots of times when uh, we um, when we started doing small changes, changes, change after change to be able in a year do a really big change about it, some transformation. That's um, that was a common topic for me. Like I tracked, I don't know, tens of uh, um, how would you say that um, of directions like that, right? So if, um, for example, we are changing a checkout page, and I know that uh, we want to have something interesting built in and check out in in the future. In the past, actually, right? Business wants everything done in the past. And um, talk about the future is just because uh, it's not really... um, We don't have a time machine, so we can go in the past and implement it. So they like uh, cope somehow with the the reality. Uh, So what I was trying to say that... uh, mm, we were changing checkout in a ways that supported the, our um, ideas that we couldn't implement right there, right now. Mm-hmm. Alfred Wesley would say it, right? Okay, okay. You mentioned that you are a person, you are a data-driven person, really keen on data. So I'm curious to hear if, if so I've got it. Uh, your point about gut feeling. I believe the more experience you have, the better gut feeling you have, the better decision you make because you observe a lot of um, cases. But what about uh, using data, for example, a ROI, of, a return of investment, or trying to track uh, how many... Uh, what is the, your budget? As a, CTO, as a CTO, your own budget. What's the budget allocated to maintenance, for example? What's the budget allocated to driving new initiatives? Any advices here? As a CTO, should you look at finance? Should you look at why? No. Well, as a CTO, you'll have to look at finance, right? There is no way uh, around it. And uh, maybe unfortunately, but then not touching finances makes you unimportant. That is um, the reality of um, uh, business life. On the other hand, I think that um, our current data-driven approaches are sometimes overstated. Like um, calculating ROI on some change is so extremely hard that you'll spend more time calculating that than implementing the actual change. Plus, taking in account everything that stuff changes, like second order and third order effects, is just mind-blowingly hard. I think that, on one hand, it's um, important to learn about system thinking. Uh, read, there is a book, really gr- great book called uh, Crossing, Cro- Crossing the Chasm. And it's just amazing about um, various... Uh, there is just m- a lot of information which uh, makes you think in a little bit um, differently than I used to think. Then, so learning about systems thinking will help with understanding second order effects. On the other hand, trying to um, get everything in uh, um, uh, data driven will it's not a way to succeed in business i think um like um, you know there there was a tweet a few weeks ago by some guy who wrote uh, that after uh, 10 years working at facebook google and so on i just understood that 
data-driven decisions are just a way to um, secure your position uh, for a manager who does a decision so nobody can like attack you, right? It's like buying an IBM, you know, nobody got fired for mm -hmm. buying IBM. So nobody got fired for making a data-driven decision. Lots of times, hmm, it's not a lot of times, but I have enough anecdotes about A-B tests showing not exactly what we wanted them to show. Like, right. uh, you know, um, like people uh, um, like old ways of doing stuff better. So you will never improve your product if you will just look at A-B test. But they will get used to a new way. You have to, it's a fine line, right? Like before about backward compatibility. I don't have any actionable advice on that stuff. Don't like, don't uh, remove your AB tests right now, if I say so. I didn't say remove AB tests. AB tests are extremely important, but they're not everything. That is one of the signals, right? Okay. So that means that we need to use all tools that we have wisely and trust your gut feeling. Got you. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think, <laughs> okay. I think still have... like, uh, yeah, anyway, just a second. I think that thinking about the problem is um, better than just believing maybe test, right? Or making a okay. data-driven decision without spending some, per, without processing that. Sure. As a CTO, you need to uh, apply all your brain power to make the best choices. Unfortunately. Okay, we still have... <laughs> Come on, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> we still have a couple questions from audience. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that we have a time, actually, for all the questions. Uh, I'm going to read two of them. Uh, so, in your opinion, how can the process of implementation of transformation be optimized? And the first one. And the second... Should or must CTO have better technical knowledge of project products than each of these colleagues, of his colleagues, his or her, I believe? Can the process of business transformation be optimized? Well, that depends on what is going on right now in the company, right? It's uh, it's uh, so, so dependent on details that uh, it's hard to give a generic advice. I had a hard time... Um, you know, uh, gathering the talk uh, because I mean that is um, all based on anecdotes, right? And um, just but just sharing the anecdotes, um, it's not it's gonna be weird. I mean, anecdotes are it's hard to um, make conclusions from anecdotes since you you will have to like see hundreds of them but then on the other hand uh, giving actionable advice without seeing what is going on and how is drawn is hard i mean how would you optimize like don't do stuff that takes too much time uh, do stuff which is faster uh, don't do dumb things do smart things right uh, do uh, write simple code don't write complex code it's uh, it's so hard i mean you'll have to go through uh, through the hard way go watch simple made easy uh, read the shape up um, by ryan singer uh, read crossing the chasm subscribe to up and wars blog um, i don't know just do the stuff which um, improves you as a professional and that will optimize your business transformations for sure. Then how about the second? If CTO should be much better than his colleagues, right? In technical, from technical perspective, to have better knowledge of product or project. I don't think that's possible. Love I don't that think answer. that's possible. That's correct answer from my side. Yeah, I mean, um, if a CTO should be a good engineer, that depends on the company, right? Uh, some companies have CTOs which are which are managers, and sometimes that's okay. I mean, uh, every C level, um, every C level, um, how do you say that? I forgot the word. I mean, CEO, CTO, CIO, 
uh, that is not um, very defined uh, um, roles that uh, they are often play to the strengths of the person who is that in, in that role. So for me, being an engineer was was fine, right? For somebody else, I don't know. I mean, that depends on a person a lot and on the needs of company as well. I mean, I had a lot of support from my colleagues, uh, like from other C-level executives. Um, so I had the ability to be a really technical CTO. If I hadn't had uh, some some of them, I would be much more of a project manager than I, than I was. I was able to offload some um, responsibilities on them. On the other hand, there is no way you can be a better engineer than your engineers. Maybe at the start of the project, right? When you were just at the start of your career, when you were just an engineer, you were just programming the system, Was the you were the better best engineer there was, and you got promoted to a CTO somehow. And I mean, because of some reasons. And uh, for the next like three months, you're the best engineer still. But then in three months, in half a year, in a year, your you, your your job is to see the whole picture, and seeing the whole picture prevents understanding all the details. So the person who is going be, to be working on that project uh, with his own hands are going to be better engineer for that project than you, maybe right? It depends on the person as well. But in general case, there is no way you're going to be a better engineer. So yeah, totally I agree think. here actually. So as a CEO, I take it, you're I take it as you were disagreeing with everything I said before, right? <laughs> no, no. But I'm just <laughs> I'm it's joking. so <laughs> it's so touching question. So you need as a CEO, you need to hire yeah. people who are much better engineers than you are. Your role your role actually is hiring these people and just try to hire the best people, smarter people. Uh, yes. That is are, that is you... uh, that is what I was trying to say before. Is not really actionable advice, right? Everyone's know you have to hire the best. Uh, how it's done? It's hard to to give actionable advice on how to hire the best. That is <laughs> really hard. Means. That's true. Make iteration. You have yeah, a my, my period is... for that. My pain is not having enough uh, best people in the market uh, looking for a job at my company. <laughs> right. Not sure how to do that. Open your borders. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So uh, we have a really fruitful conversation here. I really enjoyed talking to you. Right. I believe we are already uh, uh, up time uh, right now. Uh, Alexander, I really enjoyed uh, having a conversation with you today. Really great topic. Thank you for covering it from different perspective. Hopefully you will join uh, the next time as well, maybe with uh, some product um, product topics. We'll see, actually. Uh, have a great day today. Please subscribe to uh, a YouTube channel, Alexander. His uh, social media as well will be published on that channel. Uh, and right now, I'm happy to introduce our third speaker, uh, Dima uh, Dmitry Lavrenenko. As I said, a uh, good friend of mine. Uh, we uh, met each other when we used to be um, individual contributors a long time ago. And Dima has over 14 years of commercial experience in software development and more than 60 years of architecture and uh, experience as a big manager. Successfully led complex projects with small and middle teams covering various aspects of software development processes and methodology. The main emphasis in his work the past years has been made at innovation, the search for optimal solution for business problems and company technical competencies. Mitro is a VP of engineering at Uklon. He used to be at uh, VP uh, at the big Ukrainian bank before. Uh, long story short, his key values are Turning, turning business needs into technological implementation, transforming, transforming technologies into competitive advantages of a business, implementing even the most sophisticated ideas via cutting-edge technologies. Uh, thank you so much for jumping uh, on the call and being uh, with me today. I know that you have a lot of experience, a lot of business cases, funny, 
not sometimes not so funny to share with us today. So uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Jana. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, basically, long time no see in your life. I, I hope we can fix it soon. So what to say? You found pretty cool description of my experience. Uh, where only one thing I can clarify, I'm getting older. So experience uh, in increased, I would say, more years. <laughs> the value is still the same, I believe. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks uh, for joining our uh, for joining my speech, our uh, conference today. Uh, before I start, I want to mention that uh, my speech was uh, prepared uh, with help from ChatGPT. So, dear ChatGPT, if one day you will get access to internet and uh, somehow check this record, thanks a lot, my friend. So the artificial intelligence, without your help, it's definitely harder to prepare good slides and good, uh, let's say, remarks to such cool topics like we have today. So now, just to add a couple of works uh, about uh, me, um, I'm currently, as Yana mentioned, working as a VP of engineering uh, in Clon. So maybe most of you know this beautiful company. By the way, I know uh, most of you are, who are uh, currently in Kyiv uh, definitely prefer to sleep instead of um, hearing uh, some speech from me. So don't waste your time. Please donate to Ukrainian army of, uh, armed forces. During my speech, it will be much better than just hearing my voice. So, uh, as Jana mentioned, uh, my specialization is uh, bringing some value to business. So, no matter what it means, uh, digital transformations uh, or any other transformations. So, let's talk about it today. Let me share my screen. Uh, in case I will have any problems with sharing my screen, don't hesitate to interrupt me. <clears throat> so, I today I want to talk about... Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so today I want to talk about managing work instead of managing teams or people directly. Um, and as you can see, the topic named controlled chaos. Uh, controlled chaos by itself is a good uh, wording, let's say. So for uh, some of you, it might sound like an um, oxymoron. Yep. So, um, but don't worry. That's just a clever way to... Um, find the balance between the structure of your development um, and um, your business needs. Oh, somehow my slides changed automatically. Um, okay, so I hope you know the beautiful movie. The name is Don't Look Up. Uh, today I want to, to refer to this uh, beautiful movie. Uh, it reminds us that ignoring a problem especially when your uh, team or smart people, uh, smart colleagues uh, naming the pro this problem exactly like it is, is not fixing the problem itself. So anyway, this uh, problem will find you one day and you will not avoid uh, the results of your decisions. So the same goes uh, for managing teams in software development. Uh, many traditional um, management approaches uh, focusing on controlling uh, people, experts, uh, and uh, blocking uh, the creativity and placing them with state processes, uh, which lead us to lowering the innovation in, in, in your team. And uh, there is a beautiful quote from uh, this moves, a movie that, that uh, men always got choice. So sometimes we need just... Um, Need to pick the right choice so you can go different way ways in organization and it will lead you to different results if you don't if you never watched this movie i strongly recommend you to make it so let's talk about uh, traditional uh, approaches and uh, what what i call uh, what, what people call controlled chaos so um, if you know this um, in uh, english which is not uh, basically my native language but i still know this word um, very, very, uh, raise a phrase, herding cats. So um, managing software development team is uh, can, can be something like herding cats. Uh, but, you know, um, 
controlling cats, uh, if you know the nature of those uh, species, isn't working uh, like you expect. So uh, they are independent and smart by their nature. So in reality, it's just not working. And uh, at the same time, you expect it to, to work as well as a symphony of cats, uh, some beautiful um, symphony as a result of uh, your efforts. So um, traditional management of uh, typically uh, involves uh, micromanagement, typically produce uh, some state processes, some hierarchies, so you want uh, your team to uh, do exactly what you want, yeah? And uh, this approach, uh, unfortunately, hinders the team's ability to innovate and um, possibility to adapt to changes. So if you your a company requires some immediate actions, like, for instance, we have our worst situation. So uh, state hierarchies are not capable to do something like that. And at the same time, there is the principle of controlled chaos. Uh, when you are uh, about to embrace flexibility and uh, by trusting your team's uh, expertise, uh, experience, uh, and uh, at the same time maintaining uh, sense of order, common sense by itself, uh, you are pushing your organization to the next level. Uh, but to make it happen, uh, you need to follow uh, concrete principles of uh, controlled chaos. Uh, number one, and the most important, uh, you need to focus on outcomes. You might have a lot of different processes, small, uh, medium size, big ones, but the result of uh, all of them should be outcome, real outcome for business, uh, for technology, um, by um, emphasizing uh, the goal to your teams and experts, you um, encourage uh, innovation across organization and all, the, all your experts will find um, the better way to achieve those results and to solve the problems they face. Uh, good examples uh, from the market uh, are, for instance, uh, Google, who are promoting exactly the same approach. So you can find a lot of books uh, mentioning exactly this uh, principle. Uh, number two here is uh, trust. And uh, basically, it can be even number zero. If you are uh, from IT, let's say it's better to name it even number zero. So without trust, um, you can't count uh, on expertise of your teams. You can't count on expertise of your people. And, um, you know, like, like a reference to real life, uh, when you're visiting uh, uh, your doctor, uh, you basically believe that your doctor is qualified. But at the same time, uh, you believe that uh, this person got his uh, coffee uh, during his morning uh, and uh, has a good mood and a good uh, shape uh, to make, uh, let's say, a surgery, you potentially have a doctor is okay at the end of the day and uh, your health will be fine. Exactly the same in software development. When you trust uh, to your team, you empower them uh, to use the full potential of their knowledge, the full potential of uh, their skills and um, the result is uh, basically what we expect in uh, number one outcome. Yeah. A good example from the market uh, is uh, Spotify, where are a lot of um, videos, where are a lot of um, uh, books uh, related to that. Uh, so you can read about um, you know, independence quotes. I believe we uh, are naming it quotes. Um, capable to make decisions independently and the company company itself just trust into expertise of each uh, independent uh, squad. Uh, number three principle is uh, promoting autonomy. Uh, so the more uh, ownership and the more uh, autonomy team uh, has or expert has, um, the better um, accountability uh, on the result you might expect. 
of course that's not a result of let's say one day of work it definitely requires some time but by um let's say delegating this responsibility you can expect end-to-end uh, end-to-end -end, uh, ownership of results um, if you want to read about that uh, i believe uh, netflix is a good organization which promoted the same principle so there is a beautiful red book i believe about netflix, netflix culture so you can take a look and read about that uh, number four, um, adapting and learning from mistakes. So nowadays, this is super popular technique, uh, super popular principle. Uh, I know a lot, a lot of companies where uh, executives uh, uh, tried to promote this culture. So this is a famous uh, post-mortems, uh, root cause analysis. So just uh, take these practices and implement Basically, the um, hidden uh, secret here is that you really, really, really shouldn't punish uh, teams or people for mistakes. Uh, mistakes should be a source for um, improvements in future. So the more, um, let's say, openly uh, you discuss in your organizations made mistakes and uh, uh, the better you uh, encourage people to make um, good decisions based on this experience, the better it will fly in the future. And uh, last but not least is embracing change and uh, uncertainty in uh, your organization. So, um, this is a big topic, which typically calls uh, being agile in organization. Um, but uh, you need to avoid uh, hiring a lot of uh, super smart agile experts uh, who are producing uh, cool confluence pages ex uh, instead of uh, sharing the culture inside organization. Agile is about mindset, Agile not about uh, shiny page, uh, and uh, it should evolve inside organization. It should be a principle, not just uh, one page or about that. Um, let's talk about case studies, um, examples uh, from uh, my life. So, um, as you might know, uh, I, I have been working in different companies, uh, big ones, small ones, and uh, you might be wondering how uh, this, let's say, managed or controlled chaos can be applied in big and uh, smaller companies. Um, I want to bring uh, two, let's say, no-name examples from um, my experience. Um, in big company, typically, uh, transformation and bringing uh, such principle uh, looks like a turning of um, you know stressed out zombies uh, into a really well orchestrated um, flash mob yeah I believe that's a, a good uh, comparison so uh, zombies are not becoming to uh, to act um, like a well let's say, skilled professionals, so they are acting per se. So uh, when you are uh, facing a big company which is not uh, ready and which is not uh, having um, cats, let's say, independent uh, skilled professionals, it will not fly. So to implement uh, such uh, practices, you need to have uh, qualified people able to act independently. And this is your aim. So yeah, you need to start with uh, hiring uh, correct people, uh, forming teams, and uh, promoting, promoting, promoting culture, spreading this culture across organizations. And this this is the only way. Big company can't be changed um, partially. It will it should be changed fully, or change will be reversed. Opposite to that, uh, in small company, which is uh, having, uh, as an example, aggressive growth, um, implementing such practice can fly because um, it doesn't require a huge uh, number of, um, let's say, adopters. 
So you just just need to ignite this culture, and uh, it will spread. Definitely, it will spread, and it it works much better uh, because by by the nature of uh, small or mid sized companies uh, who are aggressive, uh, who has a willingness to um, increase in size. This is a good practice. Uh, micromanagement uh, or any other traditional approaches are much harder to implement in smaller companies just because of uh, time limitations for key people. So uh, key people should sleep, key people should rest from time to time. So at some point, you just need to trust in your team, relax, and enjoy the ride. Uh, next slide is uh, pretty... Uh, similar to the topic I opened with, with big companies. Um, typically, when uh, executive uh, is implementing the controlled chaos uh, principle, uh, we are facing with uh, some of the common concerns. Uh, the most um, typical is losing control. People are uh, afraid of um, losing control on existing processes, uh, existing uh, procedures, uh, existing hierarchy, and this is really hard for them to um, just approve, let's say, this action. Uh, next thing is uh, maintaining quality. Uh, even if your quality of work is uh, low, it's uh, hard for you to just uh, jump out of the clip and uh, believe in something cool in future. Even if you have uh, wins, it's uh, really hard to believe in yourself for the first time. Um, so don't worry if this is your case, you just need to, to make a first step and you will definitely apply it. The third, uh, and uh, I believe the last uh, typical common concern is that uh, any change in culture, any changes in approach, yeah, result to making mistakes. Uh, all of us, or most of us, prefer to not make mistakes. We are afraid of that uh, by our nature. And uh, any change, especially when you start uh, believing in your independent uh, experts and teams, uh, result uh, to small or mid-size or big-size mistakes, downtimes, uh, problems in the development, problems with parallel development, etc., etc., etc. So you can't uh, avoid it. You just need to accept it and uh, continue uh, igniting this culture across the organization. Um, and you know what? Um, controlling this chaos is not uh, like uh, throwing your rule book into a fire and uh, skipping that it's just uh, using common set, uh, sense and instead of uh, using your rules as a bible make them a good helpful guide uh, which you use a, as a basement not not as a main rule so um, abandoning all structures and abandoning all processes isn't required uh, you need to follow the same principles but add additional level of trust and level of independence on top of that. And um, it will auto automatically change by uh, focusing on outcomes, uh, continuously learning and continuously improving uh, results of your work uh, based on mistakes, based on any quality uh, problems you will uh, get, any uh, cases you will uh, see with, uh, let's say, changes in control. So just don't worry about that. Uh, now let's talk about tools and tech techniques, uh, which we are typically using uh, to make such uh, practices work. Mm, uh, nowadays, uh, tooling um, are fantastic. Yeah, So nowadays, choosing the best approach is like, choosing ice cream in reality. There are so many types of ice cream and uh, you definitely like all of them and uh, each of them has uh, its own benefits. And uh, sometimes you decide based on, let's say, non-functional factors. 
Um, so to implement um, that chaos effectively, uh, typically organizations leverage um, different tools and techniques. Uh, talking about Agile, so uh, nowadays by default people go to Scrum or Kanban um, to get all the benefits of flexibility, collaboration, continuous improvement. Uh, all of those uh, things are brought by uh, Agile methodologies by default. Um, which is better, for instance, Scrum or Kanban depends on your situation. In case you have uh, super mature teams, personally, I recommend Scrum. In case uh, for you, it's uh, more important to have the work uh, full, um, it's better to use uh, Kanban. So your choice, your organization, your context, uh, your rules. Um, just just to start with something project management so uh, nowadays um, project project management uh, should exist so uh, there should be a level of governance uh, on top of uh, beautiful effective product teams so talking about ONG conference travel asana different options uh, you just need to manage uh, the full uh, portfolio you just need to manage uh, dependencies. You just need to manage uh, planning of your activities. Uh, governance required. Do not uh, skip this important part. Communication. Communication should be fast. Communication should be effective. Your people should have a possibility to communicate independently, horizontally, no matter which tool you, you choose. Discord, okay. Uh, Slack, okay. Uh, if you are modern enough and like Telegram, even it can be an option. But don't blame me, please. Um, last but not least, techniques, uh, techniques, techniques for promoting autonomy and accountability. So uh, here, I don't have a specific tool I can uh, recommend. Um, it's all about uh, regular activities, regular check-ins, regular um, goal settings, uh, feedback sessions. And um, coffee, coffee. You definitely need to, to go for a coffee with your colleagues uh, to uh, make decisions together, to discuss your decisions you made, and uh, align with your colleagues, uh, with teams. Uh, it will definitely work better. Next, and here we are coming to measuring. Measuring is a um, keystone, let's say, in this process. No matter uh, which culture you bring, uh, this uh, culture should be measured somehow. Uh, so how to measure uh, things we call chaos. Uh, here uh, we have beautiful words like KPIs, OKRs, and metrics. Um, keyword here from my experience is OKR. The next key is metrics. KPIs depends on organization. So uh, talking about concrete things, OKRs should be straight from uh, top to bottom. Uh, there should be uh, OKRs for company wide level. There should be OKRs for concrete direction. For instance, product OKR should be aligned with IT. They should be aligned with marketing. They should be aligned with uh, operations, etc., etc., etc. Under the hood, uh, we should uh, check uh, concrete performance indicators and metrics uh, relevant for uh, our situation, for our organization. I will name uh, several typical uh, metrics. Uh, of course, you might have uh, specific for your organization. So our first um, common metric is delivery time. Uh, typically, business requires uh, clarity that something was uh, promised and it will be delivered according to the promise. The faster this delivery time, the better. Uh, it's about big things, it's about smaller tasks, and it indicates um, efficiency of development itself. Second, uh, quality metrics. No matter which organization you are working in, 
uh, the number of bugs, defects, uh, complaints from customers, uh, some unexpected issues in production uh, matters. So you need to calculate it properly. Uh, you need to have a mechanism how to pass uh, those metrics to development team. Uh, next thing is employee satisfaction. Uh, there are many types of product teams, but the only one effective uh, type of a team is uh, one who knows about real customer feelings. So employee satisfaction, uh, all the metrics should go to product team, and this is the only way. Uh, number four, uh, following commitments. And no matter how we develop in our team, we should uh, for our commitments, so we definitely need to check how uh, much uh, work items are in progress, how much items are in idle, how much uh, um, on which status, status we have items. It matters. Um, no, it's not important uh, which uh, agile methodology we have. Uh, in case we have a bottleneck somewhere in the middle of process, our development cycle is not effective at all. Of course, in the organization, you might measure, for instance, innovation, adaptability metrics. Uh, it can be a number of creative ideas in your backlog. So it's up to you. It depends on the organization and type of company. Oops, coming back. Tips. How to become... Uh, good CTO in our case, or we can uh, take instead of CTO any other uh, head of engineering, for instance, no matter how your position is named in your organization. So number one, um, and this is the most important, you need to have a clear, understandable vision. Uh, because building strong uh, relations and building a strong culture in your team is a foundation. So without this foundation, it will be a house of cards, which will be destroyed by, by the first problem. A foundation starts with vision. In case everyone understands where you're going, it will be easier to go to this point. Uh, number two, uh, fostering uh, a culture of innovation and learning. So without improving, uh, without... Um, encourage and experimentation in, in your teams without knowledge chain, it will be hard to implement such a complicated structure. I believe Yana is uh, proposing me to speed up. Yana, two minutes, please. Uh, <clears throat> number three, building strong relationships. Uh, so maintaining open communication and trusted relations is a keystone in this structure. So in case your teams and experts are not testing each other and not working uh, together, uh, controlled chaos, chaos is not your approach. You better switch to a well-orchestrated hierarchy where you command uh, all your units directly. Uh, next thing, I believe number four, continuously improving uh, your personal leadership skills. Uh, the bigger company you have, the more experts you have, the more knowledge you should have. You should be a product expert to some deepness. You should be a technology expert. You should be a market expert. You should be operations expert, all-in-one experts. MBA programs designed exactly for the same purpose. At least this is one of their purposes. And number five, uh, please embrace diversity and inclusion in your, in your organization. Encourage uh, different uh, perspectives. Um, encourage innovations. Encourage working in different conditions. Conclusion. I believe I can skip. Later, you can uh, take a look at this slide. Uh, don't worry. And the last slide, questions from you and thanks. Thanks, Dima. Thanks, ChatGPT, for helping you with this presentation. I really like that you actually covered uh, one of the important parts of CTO work is actually managing the work. I believe that a lot of um, people who would like to lead their career as a technology leader, they're mainly focused on technologies, but they skip all the part related to people management, to project management, management, but it's super important at the end of the day, delivery. 
one that matter a lot. We have some uh, questions in the chat, so I'm going to read it out loud. Thanks for exciting speech. Can you tell us, please, about the experience of changing companies in the position of VP of engineering? I noticed that you changed for company in the last 10 years. Please share how quickly you adapted to new companies and how you established communication within teams. Interesting question. The uh, question is pretty cool. Thanks a lot. I believe this is one of my ex coworkers asking. <laughs> I know a lot of enjoying today's meeting, um, today's speech. Uh, so um, I will divide this question in a couple of uh, pieces, let's say. Uh, piece number one uh, I'm a kind of extrovert person. So for me, it is not a big problem to build new connections. Uh, I enjoy talking to new people. I enjoy building new teams. I enjoy building new uh, structures, new units. Uh, so for me, it's not painful to change uh, company. Um, I'm not struggling about that. Um, this is part number one. Part number two. Uh, yep, I changed uh, some companies during the last 10 years uh, because of many reasons. Uh, uh, there are people uh, on this planet who met uh, the person they love when they uh, age 16. They married this person and they will live with the same person till the end of their life. But at the same time, there are people who are not uh, able to meet, uh, let's say, the same kind of person for a whole life. So people are different, situations are different. Uh, the same about companies. Um, in current HR world, uh, there is even a, ter a term, uh, life cycle of a person inside the organization. So for different organizations, uh, life cycle is different. It can be one year, it can be two years, three years, five years. It depends. And uh, the same applies to specialists. So it depends on the kind of person, life cycle can be different. Okay, thank you. It's a challenging question, especially from ex colleagues. All right, I know that you're an extrovert person, this is true. You make a lot of connections. I really like that you uh, mentioned the books uh, during your presentation. Any personal recommendation on some Twitter accounts to follow? YouTube channels? Mm, I'm not using Twitter a lot. I'm not using Twitter a lot. Uh, sorry, that's, that's my bad. Um, so can't recommend any Twitter accounts to follow. I know they exist, uh, but I can't uh, make an advice. Talking about YouTube, yep, uh, but I can't take all the correct, na uh, correct naming for those channels. So I, I, what I can promise, uh, I will leave uh, the, I will leave links later in comments. Thank you. Awesome. I also like that you talked about measuring success in some metrics. So, uh, back to our topic today, which is business transformation. What are the key metrics a CTO should monitor during a business transformation? Maybe it should be should be the focus on deployment frequency, bugs, push to prod, speed of delivery, maybe something else. I'm interested in your experience. I really take your question, Jan. Uh, so uh, first of all, it depends on your partner in crime, who is typically chief product officer, CPO. Uh, this position can be named differently in different organizations, but the nature is the same. So this is a super um, proactive person, typically, who wants everything today, better yesterday, uh, better yesterday of course, and uh, twice in functionality, twice more in functionality. So um, CTO or VP of engineering, depends on the uh, structure of organization, is a partner in crime for this position. So uh, the role of CPO is to think of what and why the company is doing. Uh, the responsibility of CTO or VP is to understand how and when, I mean time. Uh, how from technical perspective, how from organizational perspective, and when from time perspective. 
uh, depends on uh, concrete needs and concrete organization. Um, what to measure is uh, around uh, those uh, fields. Uh, examples. Um, in case I want uh, my teams to produce more, because this is important for our concrete situation, I am interested in metrics uh, around this field. I want teams to, to, to develop uh, more. I want teams to test more. I want teams to uh, continuously deliver uh, to avoid any delay. Uh, and uh, all, um, all our metrics about that. In case I want in our organization to concentrate on quality, of course, I measure different things. So opposite to speed, uh, I want to um, develop slower, but with higher quality. Uh, in case I have different needs, um, maybe we are doing some expansion, maybe we are doing some integrations. It's always about concrete needs and concrete organizations. So there is no silver bullet what to measure. It's always a decision between a CPU and CTO. Okay. Okay. Uh, business transformation is challenging. And usually when you try to transform business and you have established team, uh, people tend to dislike changes and resist changes. So as a technology leader, do you think that losing great people because of business transformation is acceptable for companies? Or what is your perspective here? Mm, it depends on company and depends on complete executive. Uh, I know executives who um, prefer to change people. Yep, like new blood, uh, new experience, uh, new possibilities. And at the same time, I know people, uh, executives, uh, who prefer to keep people and upskill them. Uh, both versions uh, can be effective. Uh, it always depends uh, on uh, details, organization, depends on context. Uh, somewhere uh, deep uh, knowledge uh, matters, uh, I mean, in a concrete area. Somewhere deep knowledge, deep context knowledge is not important. So you can replace people every week and it will not change a lot. So in, in concrete situation, you need to make a decision based on a lot of um, variables. Personally, I prefer to keep and to upskill people. I prefer to fire people only in case it's uh, unavoidable. Uh, examples, uh, person not performing at all, just don't want to, not working and that's it. Uh, option number two, uh, person is absolutely uh, toxic, is absolutely against uh, of uh, whatever happens in organization, no matter good it, bad it, whatever, because it typically affects the whole team or even wider. Uh, I mean, affects the whole organization. So those are two typical cases when it's better to say goodbye to person in a good way. Uh, most of our cases are, let's say, fixable. So person can be upskilled, person can be motivated, uh, person can be paid better, so this person will perform better. A uh, person can, for, for most of uh, experts, a um, good way of motivation can be found. Right. Firing people is, letting go people is actually tough. Thank you for sharing your experience with us today. I enjoyed listening as well. Awesome uh, speech. And uh, it's time for me to introduce our next speaker. The last one today, but for sure not least, uh, Nikita Voloshin. He is a co-founder and ex-CTO at Uteam. Nikita is a progressive and visionary leader with a strong technical background. He is experienced in building large-scale systems with high levels of ambiguity and complexity, looking to grow teams through compassion and empathy. Nikita is co-founder and ex-CTO at Uteam. Why Combinator Bake? marketplace for hiring engineers from better dev shops around the globe.
Uteam allows fast-growing tech companies to ramp up engineering by instantly adding full-time contractor engineers to the team. It leverages a network of 20,000 vetted engineers in Europe and Latin America. It feels like you have a lot of experience with, uh, with engineering and uh, scaling teams, hiring teams. I'm super uh, excited to hear uh, your speech today. Uh, I believe that you chose the topic for today, accelerating business transformation in a dynamic landscape, strategies for rapid adoption. So happy to have you here and floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for, for such such warm uh, introduction. Uh, let me share my screen if I remember where. Okay, I found it. And let me know uh, if you see my topic. Yep, we do. Oh, nice, nice. That's great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nikita. I'm ex-CTO and co-founder and team. Previously, I work CTO of Clicky. Right now, I'm deep dive in AI and, and, and find my new venture in AI companies. So I spent quite a bit of time uh, thinking again and, and uh, have a lot of the experiments with AI, with the teams. And what's uh, my topic today will be about like in the three uh, steps. Uh, first, we are uh, talking about what's going on right now in, in the market, in, in the world, what's going on with the AI. Next, uh, we are talking about why, uh, like, why we need moving and acting now, and what we should do with uh, all all this stuff. So let's start about like um, AI and business transformation, like for CTO. So uh, AI was uh, here for a while and uh, right now we see really emergency uh, in different technology and as a CTO or as a technical uh, leaders we need to uh, tackle these challenges and, and, and prepare our team and our company to the new world when AI will be everywhere so yeah let me let me talk about this uh, a little bit so First, like we need to understand what's the LLMs, which is uh, large language models, and why they are here and why they're all talking about this and how they can impact the uh, our businesses. So first of all, we need like to like we, we know about it, ChatGPT, OpenAI, another company. But first of all, uh. Today, right now, in this time, uh, Sam Altman is the CEO of um, uh, OpenAI. Uh, have this uh, speech in the Congress because this is the huge and 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 even like uh, U U U.S. Congress like have really uh, uh, really close attention to the how how they can impact the world. Yeah, and uh, I really love how Sam. Uh, Describe the what's the LLMs and what's their product of ChatGPT and what's the AI and it's easy and it's just several words. This is the tool. AI will not take our jobs. AI it's not like the creature. AI it's not like LLMs. It's not something like magical. It's just the tools and tools in the hand uh, of people. So we are and we are as engineering leaders as CTOs. We are the first one and these tools for us. So we are using these tools. We are uh, take these tools, provide to the, our teams, provide to the, our businesses, and we first needs to know these tools very well. So you can like imagine like it's like, of course, this is like revolution. This technical revolution is the same. I, I will believe like with invention of of some mechanical tools uh, in the past, but definitely it's the same structure and it's the same what's happening in past with the humanity and the, the same was going right now. So we have a new tools and we need to bring it to, to our team, to our company. So uh, what's like the core properties of LLMs and what they open, what these tools give us, us and what they are, um, uh, what's the ability they uh, give us to the chips. So 
first of all, ML machine learning and AI I told you like it was for for a while here with us, but they will work only for uh, machine learning engineers, data scientists, AI engineers. So really, people who uh, focus on this area. Right now, uh, large LLMs and they make it democratized for us. So right now, anyone with the chat GPT or with other tools can have uh, ability to work with the huge amount of knowledge. They, uh, as or chat GPT, you can uh, generate new uh, text, you, you can, uh, work with the context you can uh summarizing so you have like like the, these tools really good in in just several uh areas working with uh with the text with the summarization with the uh, labeling uh with uh with some prediction of the text they they they, they don't have like all the capabilities they have like mainly four main capabilities so, and here these tools for, and everybody can use it. So this is really easy to use and they open the door for, for, for engineers to use this tool in their work. So what's this landscape? Um, right now uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm the part of the Y Combinator. So I, it's the Startup Accelerator here in, in, in San Francisco. And I'm uh, like was in, in this community for 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 some time, and, and I uh, spent time to look at what's going on and figure figure out and like what's the uh, trend here. And uh, in previous batch days, we have two batches uh, each year for one uh, community for new startups. Was more than fifty six percent startups focusing on AI, and we have a lot of the open source AI just for several months. We have the baby AI, auto GPT, mini GPT-4. So right now it's AI and this uh, technology with LLM, they uh, go to the open source. And uh, even uh, Google say that they have don't have any defensibility of the AI because the AI goes to the open source and you can use it literally for free and you can just take this uh, open source libraries and technology and bring to your product and uh, uh, you can uh, adopt it or you can like uh, like mixed with another, another technology. So all, all it's not that te this technology is not like appropriate or it's not like um, closed somewhere it's available here and the landscape is with more and more in the future i see more and more open source we have like uh uh more first of uh vector database which we use to store all this uh all this data for for this we have more and more um, models which you can run offline with your appropriate data. You have like privacy, you have the security, you have uh, a lot of choice to use different models. You can combine it. You can you can set what's the preferable for for your businesses. So you you have a lot of choose. So it's not close, and and definitely you can take uh, need to take it. Um, how you uh, can use this uh, new technology? First, uh, as we are engineer in, in the engineering uh, space, we can use it for writing the code. So we have um, uh, code uh, um, pilot from GitHub. We can uh, even uh, right now have the ED course, which like focusing on writing code. You're not writing the code, you write the prompt in this idea and they write the code. And I already see um, in my experience that a lot of the a lot of like job was done by AI, like writing the code, writing the documentation, writing the text, uh, tests. So it's like the first the job which AI can take right now. 
what's it's um can be for for the whole team and for the home company it's of course the uh boosting of the productivity and uh right now it's some uh studies show that it's from 30 to 50 percent productivity boost for engineers and you know right now uh we are in the recession and we uh saw a lot of the layoffs uh past year it's uh almost half a million people was laid off and right now we see some news from from the big company that they say they will not open this job in the future because they see that these jobs already uh taken by ai so this is now it's not like in some far future we are this happening right now a lot of uh jobs and uh productivity it's not like boosting for most this productivity uh the boost it's not from the engineers maybe for engineers that 30 percent and like in the lower uh, end of this um range but for most productivity it's done by product people by uh entrepreneur by the people who will not know their uh engineering in the past they use this tools uh to chat and to create code to create some fixes to create some prototypes for for their, their businesses we have a lot of the integration you can use literally text to api and you can create the api so here is like we see uh that ai already took some jobs and uh, like it's only will be uh the amount of the job they increase and increase and a lot of the companies right now focusing on create more tools to ai to uh to uh give the people uh more uh you know like more democratized way to use engineering and technology so of course this will be impact on the career and uh uh for career and how, how can AI the, develop the career um uh, i think like this is like really good opportunity to focus on the this new knowledge to learn this tool and to find like find out the way how you can bring it to 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 your uh to your experience so one more thing which i really want to focus is like um keeping up with the space so we need to like speed up the 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 uh the changes right now is happening really fast and uh only which will be for sure with us for for like all this journey is the speed of changes and um we needs to to prepare it if you're not prepare for for um in, in the future so how you can be the fast here's like my view on this and uh first of all it's embrace the transformation so it's like be open to change uh, any, any anything in, in in your team in in your like area of responsibility uh even like um includes co cultural changes uh, and uh maybe some organization changes because uh we need to be first of all open to to with open mind to to for 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 uh any changes which requires to keep business uh, up and and running next is always continuous learning and and skill development uh especially with ai i really um encourage you to spend like set the time for each day or each weeks to learn more and more to uh to wider your toolbox to bring more and more knowledge how this works what you need um and and bring this to the to the team next is like uh innovation and experimentation innovation cannot be done without experimentation and like uh open your team and yourself to fail fail fast make a lot of experiments because right now we don't have like standards what's the ai will be in the future we we have a lot of the tools we don't know will be this baby ai or auto gpt or maybe another uh, new technology but how we can know what's will be uh fit for us and what's will help us to 
to to uh, make these changes in our business. Only the experimentation and with experimentation, you have a lot of the fails. You take one one technology, you test it. You you have like of course the measurable result. You test it. You see works it or or not. You if it works, you, you can integrate in 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 your company. If it's not, you just like uh, take another another and 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 see because. Right now, we, we definitely like can see more and more new uh, companies will be brings new ideas, and only what we can do is like experimentation and innovation with with this uh, new stuff. Next is you can done it by yourself. You definitely need the collaboration and communication and open the communication for the team, for the company that's we are on like, uh, we are on, on, on this journey together and we need to be open with each other. We need to, like, to have really open communication with the, uh, with the uh, good feedback, ideas, like quick implementation, this is only be done with the collaboration with your team. So definitely uh, please focus on have this culture of open communication and feedback. And only with this, you can you can keep with your teams and, and go uh, to this adventure for the new highs. Next, of course, this is like what's... Uh, uh, what will be on our responsibility is like uh, flexibility and adaptive leadership. So it's first of all, like what I mentioned before, is the clear communication. What's like uh, with your all um, fears and your uh, concerns, like what's your thing? Because no one know exactly uh, right now um, what's and how this will be. But when you have this clear communication about like i have this concern i have like uh, some fear that's maybe we need to bring this to our businesses and our culture uh, of engineering team but i'm not sure let's try it let's let's have some experiment this is um really um uh, help to to create uh, the good communication channel with your team and of course uh next is like have this emotional intelligence because we understand about like your teammates, what their concerns, what their fears, why they, because of course, bringing something new to learn something new, it's not easiest uh, task. And uh, you need to prepare uh, your team and call uh, and, and your team to make it. You need to create this uh, like psychological safety when they ready to take some uh, actions to, to, open their mind to to new new ideas so uh in in the end um right now ai is the things and it's really hard uh it's a lot of the teams right now focusing on it because we have it's new and we understand uh this is will be with us and this is help us and for all humanity uh with the better future we like right now understand this this change the labor market this took some jobs change another jobs this is the tool which uh who is uh, can make a new tools or uh, find a way how to use it uh, with the great efficiency will be of course the winner but it's not like one winner it will be a lot of the winners and uh, for like keep up with the pace you need to uh, embrace the changes you need to constantly uh, educate yourself and uh, always um, find uh, the way how you can uh, speed up, have really fast speed for the learning about this and uh, bring more knowledge in your team. And my understanding is only have really good culture inside your team, where is open the communication with the understanding of feeling others and uh, with um, um, embracing challenges and uh, really honest feedbacks, it can help you and your businesses, uh, I will not say survive, but thrive in the future with AI. Yep, if you have any questions, please find me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to, to connect. Awesome, thank you, Nikita. So.
Uh, I really like the style of your presentation. It feels like your team is a YC baked company. It feels like you're actually using YC branded colors to, oh, yeah. to present. Pretty awesome. Yeah, I noticed that. Nice. Uh, I like uh, actually a topic that you presented because we, today we talked a lot about um, business techno business transformation in terms of technology transformation, leadership transformation, process transformation. But you started with um, own transformation, how all engineers need to transform and adopt to a change. And I believe it's a super valuable addition to our um, topic, uh, to our team today. So um, you have a great experience in uh, observing labor tech market all over the world. And I'm really curious to get your perspective on which trends you are currently seeing in the technology mar labor market. Are companies really recruiting prompt engineers right now? Is it a big trend? Do you expect that it will grow? Here are some no. insights. So yeah, the the prompt engineering it's right now it's like I, I believe this for small amount of time because uh, we have like maybe several months we have the courses which everyone will be uh, the prompt engineer. So prompt engineering it's like knowing SQL uh, script query language if you know like to query knowledge from the data SQL using for query knowledge from database prompt engineers this query sorry SQL querying data and prompt querying knowledge from from this so it will be really easy to learn and uh, i believe in the nearest future everyone will be really good in the prompt engineering so it's not the it's not what's right now the company needs company needs right now more um people who focusing on low level architecture so how to deploy AI tools. It's still a lot of the questions because we don't have like good uh, infrastructures about the deploying um, AI, how to scale, how to scale this AI product, uh, how, for example, maybe optimize it for better um, uh, cost saving because right now it sometimes can be pricely and you need to understand. So these people, Right now, it's really uh, in the high demand. The infrastructure and knowing like on the low uh, level of this, because markets need some, we don't have like some Stripe or uh, AWS or something who will be commoditized this for the, the company. So it's like, if you can uh, maybe have some analogy, it's like when we, have this uh, when we run all this our uh, pr program on the hardware when we need like to buy the server you need to install the Linux or or install all all this stuff so this is like what needs the company most but it will be okay. some 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 period of time when some new AWS for AI will be appear here and yeah. Nice point, actually. I believe that a lot of uh, folks in technology uh, did not understand that LLMs are pretty expensive to run a production, and it's not cost efficient, yeah. especially for business. So yeah, yeah. Thin ups. Latency and one another uh, another uh, issue right now is the, with the latency because here with the latency, and we have new idea with the tokenization because we have the tokenization token windows which we can like the corpse of the text you can you, you cannot like put all the library you have like limited amount of the text which you can bring and this is another so we have a lot of the technical challenges right now but this technical challenges is more um like with with like um deep in the technology but it will be really i believe they will be really uh solved soon and yeah. Okay, awesome perspective. Does it mean that we need to uh, have more FinOps, ML Ops engineers in the future? For 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 businesses who uh, understand that AI it fits for them because it's not like a uh, fit. I have a lot of the questions uh, from uh, from my colleague, like how I can use AI. Will the AI fits for my businesses? And it's not uh, it's not clear answer and not yes for everyone. So, but if the 
company understand that AI will will have some advantage for them. Yeah, they need they need the like ops people or people who really knows how to run AI in 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 their um in in, in their team. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So let's talk about education. I know that our previous speaker, uh, Dmitro, has a health um, MBA degree. What are your thoughts about the formal education, uh, especially if is it necessary for a CTO to hold a degree in computer science and business or whatever? So... Uh, I'm fan of self education, and we don't have right now any courses or any uh, any any place when you can come and say I want to learn AI. Please teach me. No, you need to do it by yourself. And uh, yeah, we, we, we still I have like a lot of the belief this AI can help with the education. And right now I'm using AI to learn more and like like. I, I don't know like how to how to install this model and how I don't know how to this model works or how I and I all ask with the chat GPT and have this uh, like high vision and after that I'm I'm, I'm deep uh, dive but actually yeah this is like open uh, open field right now and everyone needs to find the best way to to find this knowledge for themselves until we have maybe some AI which really helps uh, will help the all of, of uh, to us to to educate better, but I don't have any any right okay. solution right now at the market. Okay, interesting. Did you use ChatGPT for uh, creating this presentation today? This presentation was created one hundred percent from ChatGPT. Okay, awesome. Nice disclaimer. By the way, I also used um, ChatGPT to improve my questions. So yeah. thanks, ChatGPT, in case you're if you're listening right now. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was the last question from my side. I enjoyed having you today with us. Um, Thank you so much for having you me. Soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. So thank you guys that you are still here with us. It was uh, pretty insightful. Uh, two and a half hours for me. I enjoyed uh, listening to our speakers. They have really different backgrounds. Uh, in the tech field. And I would like to remind you that our upcoming offline meetup is scheduled for May 30 in the Unicity Innovative Park in Kyiv. Uh, the next online meetup uh, will be on 13th of June. Stay updated with our latest announcements at the official pages of Dev Challenge and Unicity. And nice to have you here. Bye.